I like it. I like it. We're good? All right, guys. Well, thank you for that awesome introduction, Pastor, as always. Um, it's touching and humbling. You guys know a lot about our, our past and upbringing. And yeah, my father was an incredible guy. Um, it was so fun to watch him work out his own doubts and frustrations and humanity uh, as a father, because he was a single father uh, raising us, and he dealt with consequences of his broken marriage throughout his whole life. And I had the longest, a hard time reconciling his faith with all the pain he went through, you know, and all the maturity he went through. And I, I thought, uh, well, if God wants everything to be perfect, why are we not seeing this unification? You know, and it hurt me a lot growing up, and actually it was kind of a impetus to me really following and trusting God because I just didn't understand it, you know, and that's okay because I, I think I understand it a lot more today. And that kind of leads us up into, into the message, which is, well, it's not quite centered. Sorry about that. Can we adjust that at all? Okay, it is what it is. I can fill it up. It says, grow up in God. That's the idea today. Uh, maturing spiritually through the passages and promises of God. So the impetus with this really is uh, last week I was praying hard saying, Lord, what can I bring through my experience, through my skills uh, to the pulpit on Sunday? Lay it on my heart, things I've been dealing with. And uh, luckily, pastor served me up this big juicy softball to smash. And it was about choosing Jesus as a mature Christian. What that means, what it actually means, and what its implications are in your life, in your guilt, in your comfort, day to day. Tough stuff, tough stuff. Um, pastor had the, the love of Jesus coming through and I don't as much, so forgive me if I come off crass, but uh, I'll blame my father and not my mother for raising me on that. But uh, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer and uh, just ask God to be with us here. Ah, oh, God, you're enthroned above, above all. We, we cannot imagine, even if we try with our wildest imagination, how awesome, how deserving, how unbelievably holy and untouchable you are. And for you to reach down to us, give us a word in the state that we can experience and taste that, uh, should captivate us more than any promise on earth, Father. As we come here in obedience, confused about many things in life, we are trying to obey and enjoy fellowship and to experience and know your love in a tangible way that we're changed because you've lit something up in our hearts. And this is evidence 2,000 years after you left this earth in human form that we're still gathering in your name because you're here, Father. Be a testament to us today. Change our hearts. Let us be indelibly marked. Remove the wax from our ears, the hardness from our hearts, the, the, the jadedness in our eyes that doesn't want to see that which is true, that which you say is true, Father. Speak through me the words you want to say. Get rid of myself and my, my insecurities and my weakness and everything that would pervert the message, Lord God, and let it just go deep and be in fertile soil and accomplish that which you'll have it do. Amen. So, uh, as I said, Pastor got me going. He lit me up, and he was like, hey, you guys, choose Jesus. You know, he's our leader, he's our pastor. Uh, you're awesome at loving and conveying the love of Jesus. But we have to be honest with Jesus. Uh, he also comes to smash, and he comes with standards, and he, he comes with truth, and he comes with rules. And the way we usually live in this country, it's as if he didn't have a law. It's as if he didn't say it. It's as if we're confused or don't know how to obey it. It's in English. It's explained. I think the problem is us not reading it, us not obeying it, us not studying the word. It doesn't say read the word 10 minutes a day. That's a good standard. It actually says study the word of God. <laughs> know the word of God. Tie it around your neck. If you ask me the Ten Commandments, I couldn't say it. There's people who can. I, you probably can't. What I'm saying is there's a huge amount of promises that are, that are given to us, as you were saying, that are promised to us if only we take them at His Word and just believe them. Read the Word with fear of God. And that's what we're going to go through today. We're going to talk about growing up in God. And not, not as the world says, grow up! What is that? That's condescending. A kid gets scared. He feels bad, not good enough, disappointed. This is God, the ultimate Father, who's comfortable saying, grow up. It's showing you a way that we're going to go. It's not condemning you down. It's saying, guys, your path is actually to be loved, to go up. This is our nature and calling. We're not, seeds aren't meant to stay seeds forever. If a seed stayed a seed forever, you'd call it dead. 
If it quit growing, you'd call it dead. I know so many in my life, in many ways, it's dead and it's not okay. I know many adults who are spiritually dead, who are confessing Christians. That's not in line with the Word of God, and we should, we should, we should be chewing that up at the beginning of this year, auditing ourselves, figuring it out. What is wrong? What, what possibly could be going wrong aside from just devils attacking me? Maybe you're not obeying. Maybe you're not being a mature person. Maybe you're not just grown up. Maybe your spouse isn't telling you the stuff that you need to hear. Maybe you're not letting her. So growth is good. It's a good thing. Maturity, sometimes it's a scary word. Uh, no one likes to mature. It usually means hard choices, sacrifice, pain. You know, it's kind of scary. But to be honest, it's one of the most fundamental words in our lives. We mature. Mature is what we do in life. We're born, we get older, we mature, always maturing. Yeah, we mature elsewhere. It's not over then. It's not over then. That's what God says. Growth is very natural in our youth. Maturity is very natural in our youth. Think about it. Kids love it. They want to get older. They want to mature. They want more responsibilities. They want to play. They want to have guns and this. I want to smoke cigarettes. They just can't wait to grow up, right? And the parents are always like, you hang tight. It's not all great. You know, it's just, you know, it's just take your time. Enjoy your time. But uh, the kids don't know that, and they're hungry and eager. They want all the lessons. They want to fail. They want to go from first to second to third grade. They don't care. They're eager. And this is the spirit of the heart that God wants. And this is how you continue to grow and yearn is not beat yourself up when you make spiritual mistakes. You don't know God. You're confused. Well, don't be confused and anxious. Be confused. Ask about it. Learn and grow. Be a child. Be a student. Continue to be hungry and move for that. And even think about that as a kid. You mature at such a faster rate because everyone around you in your life is geared with that goal. Everyone around you. Your parents are constantly on you. Everything you think about an eight-year-old kid. All you're, all, you're, all you're corrected the whole time. It's annoying. Don't do that. Eat that. Go to bed. Get up. Go down. Do you go to school? Don't do that. Correct this. Fix this. Fix this. Fix this. You go to school. Or you go afterwards to sports. You've got a coach. Anytime you go to church, any other person has a mouth to, to correct you. And you know that, right? And we don't, we don't look back at the youth as like, oh, my, it was so hard. Everyone just beat me up. But it kind of was. If you think about it, everyone tore you apart every day. Ripped your attitude up through and paddled your butt. Took you to bed. It was a rough time for us. But we forget how crazy it was. But that was our greatest time of growth. Absolutely was. Spiritually, educationally, Mathematically, physically, fit, physical fitness wise, everything, we didn't make any decisions on our own. That's why. We gave our sovereignty up to our parents. Well, we didn't have a choice. They're bigger than us. And, uh, you know, the parents gave their sovereignty to the other parents. So they could enforce that too. So we're just, we're constantly being beaten up, so to speak. But it's all for love. It's because the parents love you. If they didn't love you, they wouldn't do anything. They'd give you $100 and say, go buy some crack and have a good weekend. You know, that's, that's what an unloving parent would do. So we know it's an amazing love. Because because they want to see the ultimate form come. So they put this effort in. They give you that pain. The kid would scream and say, don't give me that. If you love me, you give me 10 better fingers. And the dad is like, if you knew how much I loved you, you know, if you only knew what I did for you, you would never say that, you know? And so conversely, growth is much less automatic as we adult, right? Be honest with yourself. Tell me the, tell me the top 10 ways you've grown in the past year emotionally or in terms of your own maturity about being angry or snapping at your spouse. Have you consistently grown in that? Have you tried to? Or even about work or insecurities or money. Have you grown in your concept and fear of money? Why not? If you're having issues, God addresses these in the Bible. He says, don't sit there and lament and freak out and talk to your secular friends. Go to the Word. There's, there's, study the Word. It's as if there's an instruction book from God to you about these issues. It's called the Bible. No wonder he says to read it. I suggest we read it more. <laughs> So, in adults, to be honest, I think one of the biggest reasons we don't mature is, well, as I said, we're not surrounded by that feedback mechanism by nature anymore. I'm, th I'm six foot, 220 pounds. Not too many people come into my face and tell me what to do just because I'm big, right? You're not a kid. That's not going to happen. In work, maybe if you're out of line, your boss will give you corrections now and again. But if you're comfortable and you're an adult and you're coasting, you probably don't get very much feedback from them either. You're probably comfortable in what you're doing. Maybe your wife, you know, should be put in your life to correct you. You should be in her life to correct her with love, to say, I see the best in you. Cut that out. I want to see boom, 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 boom. Many times we take that away from our spouse. We say, you better not do that. Or we say, you don't cause me to improve. I won't cause you to improve. Okay, cool. Shake hands. Okay, guys. It's not a recipe for improving. It's a recipe to make the worst out of you guys and go down, right? So what do we do if that's the case? Uh, the more we are cut off from hearing feedback, the less humble we are, the less receptive we are for feedback, the more, I'm right, I'm right, I get hard-headedness, and then you're kind of, you're, you're in trouble, you know, because you can't hear from God, you can't hear from anyone. So, I'm saying this because God revealed this to me because it's about me. 
a lot of this is rooted from God revealing it to me, my own hearts, my own apprehension, my own pride of not wanting to hear people say, dude, you drank too much the other night. You were way out of line. You were embarrassing. You cut those people off and you were cursing out of control. And I said, whoa, well, the Bible does say you have too much liquor. That does tend to happen. Forgive me. You know, I completely did that, you know. And it's, uh, I hear so many Christians and it, and it makes me sick. They'll say like, due to lack of breakthrough or insecurity or financial stuff, they'll say, that's just how it is. You know, it's just how it is. I just can't have victory in this. God doesn't give me joy. I guess I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a pastor, so I'm not called to have victory or experience God's joy in this way. And, and that's, frankly, uh, or like, he, he made me do that. Do you ever say that anymore? He made me do that? That should never come out of the mouth of anyone past 10 years old. Ever. And if you do, I do too. I still do in fights. It's unacceptable, and we have to do better. You wouldn't let a kid think that, right? I, he, you made me punch him. No, you chose to punch him. We've got to work that back and talk ourselves into this. You know, just We're all children, and it's just better to have a little slice of humility with that as God teaches us that. And uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's January of 2022. A lot of us are not new Christians. A lot of us are proposing Christians that are like the biggest Christians in all of our people's lives that we know. You may be the most established Christian there. It's time to grow up, guys. It's time to eat pure spiritual food. It's time not to come to the every week sucking on the teeth of the pastor to get fed for the week. You know, it's like you need to learn how to feed yourself and go home and be many pastors, many Christ, like Jerry was saying. We're called to walk up in the way Christ did in his faith, in his exploits. He may have even wondered, like, I don't know if you guys have watched The Chosen, but it was a beautiful time when he was called by his mother to do the first miracle. And the personified Jesus is almost, I wouldn't say insecure, but he wasn't sure if it was his time to move into a miracle. You know, he wasn't sure. So in the same sense, guys, we're going to have insecurities taking God for what he says. But we have to follow what he says. And we have to act as if, we can't be afraid as if we don't have a guidepost to do it. You know, we've got to go back to the guidepost. Hosea 4.6 says, my people are what? They're destroyed from the lack of knowledge. I don't want to be destroyed because I chose not to read something. He's saying that. Because you have rejected knowledge, not kind of read it, you've rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the life of God, I will also ignore your children. God is a God of love, but I, I mean, there's, that's pretty clear. Because you have rejected knowledge. So yeah, seek ye first today. Who are you going to serve? You know, you're given, you're given the gospel. You can read and reject it. Just know that God is going to hold you accountable to that. He says that. If you know it and read it, you're going to see it. Sorry. I mean, it's real talk. You can, you can look at yourself in the face and deny it all you want, but it says in the Word that you will be held accountable. Uh, next slide, por favor. Hey, there we go. And believe it or not, if you read the Bible, lo and behold, you are actually commanded and told to audit yourselves as a function of healthy living for your own happiness as well. Uh, God, God commands self-audit. Uh, as we said before, you have to look at yourself because no one else is going to do it at this stage. You know, if your dad's gone, my dad's gone. I can't ask him about moral things. Um, he taught me to go to God and to refer to his word and to take counsel with him or other respected people in your life. But on your own, you're going to falter. You know, that's just how we are. We need to have support. We need to be reinforce what we believe and have people in our lives like a Timothy. Wait, a Timothy below you? Wait. You need to be a Paul to a Timothy and to have a Timothy or something. So basically, you need to be discipling and be discipled at the same time. It keeps things flowing. When you're receiving things and teaching things, it makes you more accountable. Uh, Romans 12.3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Be rational. I mean, we're just, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just logical conclusions of what the Bible says. You know, let's just not fluff it. It's very true. It's straightforward there. Cause and effect, right? But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So granted, everyone is different. Everyone won't believe it exactly the same. But the point is, God gives you a certain amount of faith, and you have to steward it. You have to take what you have and the convictions it makes in your heart, and you have to act on it. Or you have to be accountable for not acting on it. But be aware of that, own it, and process that in your mind that you are choosing not to act on it. Uh, it's time for an audit, guys. It's just time for an audit. It's New Year. As Pastor said last year, hey, let's just cut to the chase. Choose Jesus. He, he makes it very clear. He chooses you. 
He chooses you all through the Bible. He tells us he's not ambiguous about it, you know. He's saying, I choose you. It's New Year. Times of auditing take place for firms. We all do our taxes. We, take, we put a lot of time and effort and stress into doing, doing these things because we have to, right? Hail unto Caesar, what's Caesar's? Hail unto God, what's God's? So we take a lot of time for auditing our, our things so we don't want to get in trouble about a tax man, but none of us are really worried about eternity. That's not very logical. We care much more about our, uh, you know, our retirement and how much we're going to have to coast into death, but not uh, the state of our hearts and what God says is ultimately important. Um, we've got to do better. You know, we've got to grow up. We've got we to welcome this and take the challenge and push through. I, and we're talking about auditing everything, not just our own growth. Sure, are you growing in the fruits of the Spirit? That's, that's certainly important. But our, our patterns of attitudes and actions, you know, uh, even saying how angry you get when you lose your keys. Uh, do you dwell in it? Do you let everyone know in the house how angry you are and how stupid and they're going to feel your pain? I know because I dealt with this the other day. I had plans with a friend. I lost my keys. And it's, I really go crazy when I lose my keys. I get angry. And everyone, I just, it's like insanity. And I just, I was like praying. I was like, Lord, is this your will for me right now? I'm supposed to go hang out with a friend who's having some familiar, his, his dad just passed too. He wanted to have a good brotherly time and I just got this attack of anger and I had to spare a key. But it was just like, Lord, am I eight years old and want to have a pity party and be angry and ruin my day and everyone's day just because I couldn't find my keys? Believe it or not, as a 36-year-old person, that was a hard conversation to have with myself because I almost wanted to have a pity party and give it and not do anything. Just be angry and kick. And I had a spare key and I prayed and the Lord's just like, that's a choice. You can go do whatever you wanted to do. You'll be fine. And even that, I can't say it's always that way, but even that wouldn't have happened like three years ago. You know, I, I, can't, I can't change it. I'm angry. This is how it's going to be. But um, when you audit it, you'll see maybe, you know, maybe it's time for some upgrades in your life that you wish had been there for a while, you know. And uh, so, so we're going to do it today. We're going to do it collectively as a group, as a family. So I'm going to have everyone close your eyes just for a minute. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to be as honest as you can with yourself. So self-audit. So Christian, you confess God is your Lord and Savior. He's first and foremost in your life. You will be ready to espouse and say these to people, or would you not? Would you be ready to say them to God if you could see your heart and the way you allocated your time? Are you growing in the fruits of the Spirit tangibly? Would those around you say that? He's more loving. He's got a more light heart. He's more joy, more peaceful. He's more gentle. He's more self-controlled. Are you growing in your knowledge and experience of the Word of God? Uh, did it used to be really boring and stories lifeless? Are they coming to you now and speaking to your heart in ways that only God can and that Christians will only know? You know, is he making correlations in your life from things that you read that bring life, make it more, more in line with what God said reality is? In other words, is he impacting your life, bringing you over, building your faith, and you have, do you have a clear direction and confidence that God is guiding your path? Okay, eyes open. Thank you guys for that. And uh, so you're probably mixed like me. Some things really affirmed. Some things maybe, yeah, you certainly could grow more in that. You know, that's rough. That's, uh, yeah, we have, we have promises in that. And I would challenge you, uh, not everything is due to, you know, God attacking us or, oh, my health is so bad. A lot of it, I hate to say it, could simply be due to disobedience and lack of maturity with prayer and Bible reading and doing the basic things that God says to do to build yourself, like fellowship in church. James 1.22 says, sorry, I just messed this up. Uh, 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. It just sounds simple. Um, I don't always do that, and it's just so clear. And we need to be reminded way often, way more often than we need to be taught. Uh, one that really, I almost brought me to tears, um, just thinking about it is C.S. Lewis, uh, one of my favorite Christian apologist authors, and he wrote something about prayer. And he said, now the disquieting thing, prayer and obedience, uh, now the disquiet disquieting thing is not simply that we skimp and begrudge prayer. The really disquieting thing is it should have to be numbered among duties at all. <laughs> right. For we believe that we're created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And if the few, the very few minutes that we now spend on intercourse with God are a burden to us rather than a delight, what then? What I'm saying is, guys, if we pray five minutes a day, 
Uh, and there are people, we have so much to unlock with God in our lives, in our walk, in our spirit, in our emotions, in our breakthroughs, in our perception of life, of money, of everything. As, as you were saying, I don't think Christians are meant to be just like everyone else, a little poorer, a little more meeker, uglier, dirtier clothes who mention God a bit more often than everyone else. I don't think that's what the, the God's people were called to do, or called to reflect in the Bible. I don't think generationally that's our calling or our inheritance. I think there's more to it. But as we all know, um, obedience warrants blessing, and sometimes we have to obey uh, before we see that. And so, next slide, please. Okay, sorry. I was going to say real talk. A little bit more about God's view about complacency. <laughs> Keep the spirit going. I don't know about you guys, but the Bible does say that if we fear God, uh, He is our complete, like we have it built in, we've got to fear things. But God says it's actually designed that if we put Him and fear Him first, seek Him first, His righteousness, His kingdom, all the other fears are taken care of by Him. That's what he promises. But the converse is also true. If you don't put him fears, your anxieties will grab everything of the world, but you won't fear God. Yeah. That's the thing. So you can choose. You can choose that. But in society, I see that near 100%. Even in the grandparents' days and age, 50 years ago, they tell me when there was a collective esteem in this country about a national pride. And it was a national pride of leadership, of character. They weren't always like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But they knew their socio-moral values were rooted in Ju Judeo-Christian values. And we talked about this. Presidents talked about God. It wasn't shunned. Nuclear families were praised, you know. Uh, heterosexuality was okay. Okay, it was nice, nuclear families, all these things. And as you know, we could have whole diatribes on, we I feel like a lot of that idea has been attacked in this country. You know, there's almost no uh how do you say, like, common ideology of what morals are anymore, or what correct is, you know. Um, someone will get canceled for making an off remark about a woman's blouse, you know, which, okay, it's immoral, but then promote homosexuality and infidelity to the next turn. So, no wonder we're schizophrenic. We have no one, where do your values come from? We used to say here, 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 and it ends in the Bible. Now it's, well, no, the Bible doesn't matter, we're just irrationally picking random things and arguing about it. I mean, it's chaotic as, as heck, and if you talk to any of your family members, it's seems that more than peace and more than love and more than even happy things, they just want to talk about fear. What's going on in this country? What about COVID? What about this? What's going to happen? I'm sick of it, guys. I don't know about you. I just see fear everywhere I go. And even from Christians that I know, you know, that are espousing that, that God is taking care of everything, including their body, yet complete lack of faith when it comes to this. So I see a complacency in our society in regard to following or even allocating meaning to God. You know, we're a godless society and we're, we're a rack full of fears. So now is time. Now is time for you guys to walk up, to be charged with God, to be able to be a, a pillar, to be able to show this glory, this realness to the people you interact with, for sure. Uh, and we can see God's warning in the Bible all about this, guys. Um, Jesus warns us like Laodicea, uh, the church of Laodicea. You know, it's better to be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus said this, spit you out of my mouth. Jesus, the happy guy, love everyone. He and he was. He loved you passionately enough to say, I will spit you out. I will spit you out. If your, if your dad wants the best for you, he says, you screw up, you're going to be kicked out. You're going to be kicked out. I mean, it's the same thing, but more. And eternal. Let's be serious about it. And what is it? If someone comes up to you and professes their love for you and you say, oh, that's cool. That's not what they wanted. You, you, you flipped that love. You rejected that love. So it just be own it. Own it. Jesus is saying, I'm owning it. You rejected me. And I'll reject you. But he doesn't want to. He wants you to come and ex experience the goodness, the freedom. Um, what was it? Oh, gosh. I think I was reading yesterday. I, I didn't complete the talk this morning. I was going to write more. But there was something in the... Devo I read yesterday that talked about after Jesus had walked, walked through the regions where he healed all these people, um, the most of it, he, he was so angry because he went back and they were completely unbelieving. All these miracles he did were nothing. Let that be a side point. Miracles don't matter. We get miracles in our lives every day. Even your very breath, that you haven't died. You don't know why you can breathe. You don't know all the times that you said, God, if he just come through. He's came through so many times. Like you said, we could pray forever. Or even people, look at Moses, look at the Red Sea. Miracle after miracle after miracle, that doesn't change us. We see miracles and forget them. We're stupid. We're like goldfish, you know. What we need is maturity. <laughs> That's what we need, maturity. That's what we need. It's, I just said, if God just moved in my life, I'd follow him forever. I've had that happen. I've not followed him a week later. I mean, the realest things. Please come through this amazing way. Oh, my God, I'm so holy. Oh, and then two weeks later, I'm sinning, choosing sin instead of his promises again. You know, it's, we got to do better, guys. We've got to do better. 
And then he says, you guys act like I didn't give you a law. You say to love me. You didn't give me a law. God is appealing to you. Jesus is appealing to you. Please don't wait till your last four years and get serious about this. Don't wait till your deathbed and say, oh, it all made sense only because I read it now. Do it now. Live, live your greatest life today by obeying today. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you got to do. Um, but it's... it's Going back to being good soil and what Pastor was saying last week about being tenderized for maturation. Um, you know, hard hearts, hard meat can't be tenderized. It re requires a lot to tenderize tough meat. You know, and a lot of steps usually. A lot of steps, you've got to beat the crap out of it. You've got to hammer it. And a lot of times you've got to use chemicals, you know, whether it's buttermilk or whether it's lemon juice or something like that to actually tenderize it too. And God talks a lot about our hearts being hard by nature, from the world, just being in the world, seeing what's on the internet, seeing what people are freaking about, spending five minutes looking at pictures online you shouldn't do when you're alone. All of these things can harden your heart and make it less sensitive to hearing the Spirit. Every little thing, right? So, so God's point is sometimes He beats you into submission. Then sometimes, you know, He, he marinates you and makes you, makes you soft with, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's humility or whether it's the love of someone who takes you aside and shows you the way to grow up. Um, God, God talks a lot about salt, you know, and salt's really weird. You add salt to food. Without salt, food sucks. With too much salt, food is ruined. But salt is actually what makes everything awesome. You don't want the salt. Everything is, you know, risen by it. And that's how Christians are, I think, in people. When I see a Christian, uh, a real Christian, the love of God raises everyone in the room. It's, it's encouraging. It's happy. It's loving. And that's who Jesus was. I mean, think about all the people that were drawn to him because he was loving. He was uplifting. He made people feel at peace. And uh, God's job, as we'll see in some examples in the Bible next, he's, God, God's path for us isn't just to make us fat and happy and we get obese, coast, and die. No, no. He wants us to be Navy SEALs for him. He wants us to be the tip of the spear of special forces. So what are special forces? They have an inkling of maybe wanting to do it, maybe being called to do it, not sure if they can do it, seeing what they can do, prep up for it, submitting themselves to the doctrine of obedience. And they're smashed, and they're hammered, and they're hurt. And then they recover, and they know it's for a good reason. And by the end, they're more powerful, more, ca more capable, and absolutely unstoppable. And it's only due to the breaking down and subjecting themselves to radical discipline and growing up. Um, but yeah, the fat guy who's just like super dying of cancer, he's just happy. He didn't have to do anything. But is the seal going to look at him and be like, well, I wish I was like you? No, he won't. He will not. So let's, let's think about being seals rather than the guy with, I just want a nice life. Nothing's going to happen to me. Just coast until I die. That's not why we're here, guys. We're meant to go out with a bang. Meant to go out with a bang. And furthermore, this is just a fun thing. Uh, I had to think, I was thinking about God toiling my soil and how he tears it up when it's hard and clay and he mixes sign, or like, you know, lime and gypsum and salt to make fertilizer or make good soil. But also, you know what makes... Fertilizer, you know what makes soil really, really good? Fertilizer makes soil really, really good. And to children, what is fertilizer? It's poop. It's disgusting. If you had a parent say, hey, we're going to throw this poop in your life and make it much better. Oh, I don't want any poop. Oh, it's poop. No. But the mature person who's matured knows it's absolutely essential and necessary. A little smelly, a little stinky, a little messy, but it's the key to growth. And if you don't have that fertilizer, those trials in your life having to run to God, you're going to coast and you're never going to become a seal. You're just going to sit there and be limp and then uh, go, go get them. You know, it's, I don't want to be that way. I don't think God calls us to be that way. Next slide, poor favors. Okay, so quickly, some examples of maturity in the Bible. Just quick pointing. As I was saying, the Bible is a love letter to you. It's an instruction for all your questions and concerns about life. Believe it or not, there are narrative stories of people that might overlay your experiences in life. And reading it might help you apply those to your life, too. So we're just going to run through a few. Um, first of all, thank God that he uses imperfect people. And that it's through his sacrifice, Jesus' worth, Jesus' sacrifice and atonement and justice that we're justified. All we have to do is accept. Uh, I love what you were saying last week that the big difference with people that choose Jesus is that Jesus rides us. We don't ride him. He rides us. It's up to him. It's up to us to buck him off or to wrestle with him and then get broken and say, okay, you, you got it. You got it. You know what I'm saying? It's, that's kind of it. And all these guys, God rode and he let them stay. They didn't buck him off. They had times where they were bucking, but eventually God got the bit in their mouth and that's kind of it. I mean, Abraham, incredibly ma mature, right? He was the forefather of us, you know, the Israel nation. He was chose. He was... I, 
you can correct me, I'm not the scholar with Abraham, but my understanding was he was kind of just always good. Like he had a really good gift of faith. And yeah, he was a little bit scared and as he traveled and sojourned, he did some sins where he like told Pharaoh that his wife was his sister because he was afraid of her. He just wasn't trusting God and was afraid of some people. So he's like us, you know, he's not perfect, but God took him from place to place to place as leave your, leave your place of comfort your society, your expectations of your life, everything. Extrapolate that in any way you could to your life now. Whatever's comfortable. Trust me, we're taking everything over here. Okay. And to do that again, and again, and again, in conflicts with everyone as he went, is just insane. Not only that, but God kept saying, it's because of your heart that I'm choosing you. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was like, don't kill Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't do that. And he like had a powwow with God because he was close with God. And God's like, they're a horrible place. We're going to kill it. Abraham went up and was like, you know, if there's 100 people, don't kill it. And he goes, okay, for 100 people, I won't. And then he goes, man, that's too much. It's probably not 100 people. There's 50 people. You know, he goes, okay, if there's 50 people, I won't kill it. Abraham finally petitioned him. I think he asked for like, what, 10 people or something like that? And God said, yeah, it's okay. I read that and I was like, dude, I want to talk to God like that. To be that comfortable that you can meekly go up and actually, you know, shout it out. Is that possible? Maybe if we obey like uh, Abraham, we might see more of that in our lives. A tangible, a tangible presence of God. He's saying it's possible right here. I think that's exciting. And not only that, but think about being so, so confident in God and hearing His voice and knowing what He does and who He is in your life that you would take your son and kill it. Like, I don't know anyone. I, that'd be really hard for me. Could you take your son? You'd want to, but it would be tough. Take, take Jocelyn, go kill her. Okay, Lord, and he did. He took Isaac and was about to cut it. Boom. God said, no, 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 I'll provide the sacrifice. You know? And the point was, he was broken for God. Abraham was willing and trusted that... Oh, and that was after Isaac was promised to him for his whole life. Remember that? So he waited his whole life for this wonderful promise. It finally came to fruition, and God said, give me that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it from you. Oh, it's, that's a level of maturity that we hope to get to, guys. But these are our forefathers, and this is what we can be. Uh, next one, Joseph. You guys know Joseph. Uh, had the coat of many colors. Jacob was his father. Um, kind of family line here. He was interesting because he was very outwardly blessed. Uh, he was very good-looking, probably very charismatic, very smart, interpreted dreams, well-spoken, but obviously not quite good with people or didn't quite have the inward intelligence or maturity that God wanted. Uh, he was a little rough around his brothers. His brothers weren't having that. Sold him into slavery, as you guys know. Sold him for dead. Um, that would have been pretty rough if you were Joseph, especially when you're confident that God loved you and chose you and had all these things for you, and now you have no future. Yeah. And you're, you're going to die. Oh, okay. But God. You know, I think Joseph realized these were tests in his heart. Because he was a pretty smart guy. He interpreted dreams. He had some instinct. And he was raised by his father to love and fear God. So I kind of see as his own path took him to Egypt. And he was various levels of really high esteem and then crashing down. Real high esteem and crashing down. Cool thing to note with, uh, was it Pharaoh's wife? He avoided the infidelity he could have had there. Not what David did, but interesting how that worked. He was smart enough to avoid that. And I guess we might infer that throughout his maturation, when he finally met up with his brothers, he had the God-given Holy Spirit insight to not be prideful, to not be full of malice, and to be like, whoa, I can finally see the mature... You matured me into this person to bless you. And you matured me into this strength, strong person that I can deliver my nation. Whereas if I had this power when I was 20, I might have murdered all my brothers. You know, I certainly should have, you know. Well, uh, moving on to David, a little bit different, right? David is kind of the pinnacle in the Bible of the purest heart that runs towards God no matter what. I don't know how he does it. I envy him, but I want to be like him very much. And he grew up almost the opposite of Joseph. I'd say more, less polished, you know, less outwardly charismatic, but he had everything inside. He had the passion, he had the heart, he had the absolute confidence in who God said he was, ruddy and brave. And God, God gave him guidance. And and uh, he showed us again that he was eager to fail. He was eager to run. Like, he didn't sit there and think, well, maybe I'm stupid to attack Goliath. No, he ran at Goliath and said, well, if I mess up, God will get me. You know, running here and there. He didn't plan everything out. A lot of David's life was on the run. He was constantly full of anxiety. But he also showed us, run to God, run to God, run to God, run to God. Even when he knew God and he committed infidelity and murder, once he realized that, he was crushed and ran to God. He paid his dues. He got up and went on again. So let it be a lesson to us. No matter what you do in life, 
especially after knowing God, you're still possible of doing the unbelievable. And that's okay because God forgives the unbelievable and not. So that's incredible freedom. And Jacob. Isaac's son. Jacob, I kind of hated when I read about him in the Bible. He was kind of a swindler. You know, he, he cheated his dad. He cheated his brother out of their birthright. Um, I just hated him. And it was only until, I don't, honestly, like a week ago that I even had this concept of like, well, maybe I should learn about him. Like, I, I just thought he was evil and I couldn't get anything. But sure enough, I realized I'm Jacob. You know, I'm Jacob very much in how I swindle people and how I have before, how I even lie to myself. But, uh, so he cheated his father, but he... He was also shown to be a man after God's heart from the inheritance from his father. So even though he was broken, even though he was more scared about his own possessions than trusting God and being obedient to him, God still worked it out. You know, when he left, he was pushed away because of his um, lying to his parents. He was sent away. And as you know, with Laban, he gets swindled for like 20 years himself. You know, he gets swindled, tricked with the wife, the wrong wife, then the other wife. And, and uh He's brought up, finally, when he leaves Laban. Um, Laban, who he's working with, begins to treat him really badly, cheat him out of money, and finally Jacob's like, all right, I need to go. I'm divorcing. I'm moving out. So he just left. He took all of Laban's daughters and just bounced. Uh, Laban chased him down, and it was just so beautiful because during the discourse of this, Jacob is shown as one of the most mature, capable, well-spoken, intelligent people, unlike how he was earlier. I mean, you can imagine him as a little insecure swindler lying, working with his mom to steal the birthright and all this stuff, and being a coward running away. And in this time, he confronts Laban with character as a mature man, explaining exactly what happened and giving honor to God. And you see him right before he goes back to Esau, getting on his knees, saying, God, of all that I've done, all the disgust, all the pain, everything you've repaid me, uh, all the blessings you have are so far beyond anything I've deserved. And it's because of God's ultimate grace. You know, and all four of these guys, um, they have amazing, amazing successes, but insane failures, too. And so there's lots that we can glean in that if we just spend the time. And the coolest thing about all these guys is not one of them could have seen what God had in store for them at the beginning. Abraham could not have known that he would have been the father of many nations. Joseph would have no idea that he would be the one, well, he did kind of have a dream that he'd be saving his brothers, but he could have never known that he'd actually be delivering the nation of Israel. Um, David would have never imagined that he, just by being honorful to God and obedient to him, that he would be the king of the greatest nation of that time, you know, leading into the greatest prosperity and leading into his son Solomon. And Jacob, um, he never would have thought that from his insecure start of betraying his family, he would be brought up as a man of character, equal with his brother, redeemed, reinstated, and with a hope in a sense of goodness that he never probably had this whole half of his life. You know, and this is, this is God's impact on their life. So, final slide. Thank you, sir. Okay, so basically, the takeaways... Okay, we'll figure that out next time. The takeaways that you can see, if you study them, the collecting, is that maturing, simply put, every one of those guys shows us that maturing isn't acting a certain way or saying the right thing all the time. It's running to God for everything always. Come on. That's it. Nothing more. The more broken they are, the more mature they are. The more eager they are to say they need God, the more exalted they are in the Bible. It's a common tenet with every one of them. They run to God for their problems, they praise Him in their pleasure, and they search Him for His promises and His perpetual purpose. C.S. Lewis says, relying on God has to begin every day again as if nothing had yet been done. You have to throw your pride down. You have to say, I don't know it. You have to say, I have been disobedient. I haven't gone to you with lust and passion, passion like I should. I've been going to these for that. And it's an everyday kind of thing. These are the character of the people, the forefathers we just saw. Um, and through their struggles, they didn't ever but God. They didn't ever blame God for their struggles, actually. Uh, God chased them. And even with Jacob, he wrestled with God. He literally wrestled with God. So they pursued God. They knew what God was in their life. They knew their own weaknesses and had their heads butted against things. And God would take them and throw it, you know, inject that fertilizer into their life, that, that pain, to exactly the growing up that he wanted. And furthermore, every one of them, from David to Jacob, I think they learned to lean into God when they had pressure. And they didn't lament 
Lamenting is what faithless people do. Lamenting is what godless people do. Lamenting is worshiping a problem as being sovereign and it demands your attention and your worry and anxiety over God, his promises, his sovereignty, his power, his love for you, which is kind of demonic. So maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should learn to lean into God and love him through the discipline he gives us and the maturation. Or as the pastor says, don't go to the phone, go to the throne. I like that one. I think I heard that from you. Um, and furthermore, for us guys, it, it wasn't about how awesome their love was for God, how steadfast there was, how rock solid they were, and how great their faith was. It, they knew it really was about God. They knew God intimately for how steadfast he was. Abraham knew it was God that chose him. Abraham knew all he had to do was obey. Um, all these guys didn't, they weren't all in spots in their life that they weren't sure where to go. Whether it was Abraham, whether it was Joseph, a lot of them were hands tied behind their back. They didn't know where to go. And I know so many Christians, me included, say, God, if only God would show me what to do. If only God would show me where to go next. Oh, I just need some direction. The first thing he says in the Bible is obey. Maybe that's the first place you need to go. Just saying. Maybe you don't need to divine anything. You need to be a good student. You need to be a kid again. You need to baptize yourself in the tenets of being disciplined. Maybe that's the key to your growth. Maybe that's the key to your breakthrough with God. I really wonder, considering he tells us to do it. And I know I don't have the fear of God as much as it could be in my life. I don't think you guys do either. But these are promises for us. And I don't say this to bring you down. I, I say this with tremendous excitement of what God wants to do in our lives. What he wants to do in their lives. Unbelievably generational shaking things in ways that you can't see. Uh, so you can be around your friends and they may have $800,000 in their bank and they're insecure and they don't know why and you can speak as to why. You know, when people are around you and they say, you're calm, you're like an anxiety sink. Every time I'm around you, you make me feel peaceful. You say, well, that's Jesus. That's who Jesus was. Let me tell you about Jesus, you know. Um, the world is looking for meaning right now. They're looking for it. You can see it everywhere. Uh, people strive for an identity, strive to be right, strive to fight and be on the side of everyone else to be right. And it's just a yearning for us to have God in our lives more. You know, it's just, it's just more of a reflection that if only we devoted ourselves and our anxieties to studying the word uh, with as much fervency as, as God tells us we should, uh, we might see some serious breakthroughs in our lives that, that really change our lives. So, the final point I think that was really important was, it's kind of like obedience as a kid. Uh, we would love to just know mentally that your dad has the best uh, best intention for you and everything he does is out of love and to help you do better. But as a kid, you don't believe that. You don't. You believe the lie like, you want me to be unhappy. You know, you don't want me to enjoy that candy. I want to go outside. But we also know that through your parents, by the time you're 20, 25, 30 years old, and you've gone through some of the pains, anxieties, resentments, and disappointments of life, you understand your parents so much more, and you appreciate them so much more. So let's be adults. Let's mature. Let's apply that to God. Let's apply it to God. With our parents, we disrespected them, didn't appreciate them till too late, but then we knew their heart to us was good. Let's think ahead with God. God. He's saying, just like that, I teach you the same way. Follow my tenets. Maybe in time you'll realize they're out of love and they're the best for you. We always think we want to be convinced. First, as children, it didn't work that way. Why would it change radically now? Why not continue learning the way we were, which is submit, obey, and then maybe the love and the emotion and the experience will follow that. That's it for today, guys. Let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. Ah, Lord, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your word. Um, and thank you for the strength you give us to be inspired, Lord God, to chase you, to feel equipped uh, through our weakness, to have the strength to, to grab onto your promises, to grab onto your energy, and to realize that we're racing away every day, but we're renewed by you in our hearts, Lord. And I'm just a dying man preaching to dying men, Father, but that the words that come out will, will be real and be life-changing, Lord God, to myself and to those online, to those here today, and that... Uh, you who started good work will make it, make it come into completion, Father. So bless us today. Bless us in our week, Lord. Help us to mature and grow in a new way with new fears, new motivations, new hopes, supernatural things that will leave us changed, Father. We don't want to be the same. Let us not be the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Awesome. So good. So good. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that.
we're growing. We're growing. We got a long ways to go. Yeah, it's not. It's not over in this life. It's not over in this life. It goes a lot more. We'll, we'll see you in.